Chapter Five of Richard the Second, Makers of History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Richard the Second, Makers of History by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Five, Childhood of Richard, A.D. thirteen sixty six to thirteen seventy. The child of Edward the Black Prince, who afterward became Richard the Second, King of England, was born at Bordeaux in the southwestern part of France in the year thirteen sixty seven in the midst of a scene of great military bustle and excitement. The circumstances were these. When peace was finally made between England and France, after the wars described in the last chapter were over, one of the results of the treaty which was made was that certain provinces in the southwestern part of France were ceded to England, and formed into a principality called Aquitaine, and this principality was placed under the dominion of the Black Prince. The title of the Prince was thenceforth not only Prince of Wales, but also Prince of Aquitaine. The city of Bordeaux, near the mouth of the Garonne, as shown by the map, was the chief city of Aquitaine. There the prince established his court, and reigned, as it were, for several years in great splendor. The fame which he had acquired attracted to his court a great number of knights and nobles from all lands, and whenever a great personage had any wrongs, real or imaginary, to be redressed, or any political end to gain which required the force of arms, he was very likely to come to the prince of Aquitaine, in order, if possible, to secure his aid. Prince Edward was rather pleased than otherwise with these applications, for he loved war much better than peace, and though he evinced a great deal of moderation and generosity in his conduct in the treatment of his vanquished enemies, he was none the less really excited and pleased with the glory and renown which his victories gained him. About six months before Richard was born, while Edward was living with the princess, his wife, in Bordeaux, he received an application for aid from a certain Don Pedro, who claimed to be King of Navarre in Spain, but who had been expelled from his kingdom by his brother. There was also a certain James who claimed to be the King of Majorca, a large island in the Mediterranean Sea, who was in much the same situation in respect to his kingdom. Prince Edward promised to aid Don Pedro in recovering his throne, and he forthwith began to make preparations to this end. He also promised James that, as soon as he had accomplished the work which he had undertaken for Don Pedro, he would fit out an expedition to Majorca, and so restore him too to his kingdom. The preparations which he made for the expedition into Spain were prosecuted in a very vigorous manner. Don Pedro was destitute of means as well as of men, and Edward was obliged to raise a large sum of money for the provisioning and paying of his troops. His vassals, the nobles and barons of his principality, were obliged to furnish the men, it being the custom in those times that each vassal should bring to his lord, in case of war, as many soldiers as could be spared from among his own tenants and retainers, some fifty, some one hundred, and some two hundred, or even more, according to the extent and populousness of their estates. One of the nobles in Prince Edward's service, named Lord d'Albret, had offered to bring a thousand men. The prince had asked him on some public occasion, in presence of other knights and noblemen, how many men he could furnish for the expedition. Quote, "'My lord,' replied Lord d'Albret, "'if you really wish for all the strength that I can furnish, I can bring you a thousand lances, and still have enough at home to guard the country.'" Quote. The prince was surprised at this answer. He did not know, it seems, how powerful the barons of his principality were. Quote, "'By my head,' said he, addressing Lord d'Albret and speaking in French, which was of course the language of Aquitaine, that will be very handsome. End quote. He then turned to some English nobles who were near, and speaking in English, said it was worth while to rule in a country where one baron could attend his lord with a thousand lances. He was ashamed not to accept this offer, for according to the ideas of these times, it would not be at all consistent with what was expected of a prince that he should not be able to maintain and pay as many troops as his barons could bring him. So he said hastily, turning to d'Albret, that he engaged them all. Although in the end Don Pedro, if he succeeded in regaining his kingdom, was to refund the expenses of the war, yet, in the first instance, it was necessary for the prince to raise the money, and he soon found that it would be very difficult for him to raise enough. He was unwilling to tax too heavily the subjects of his principality, and so after collecting as much as he thought prudent in that way, he sent to England to his father, explaining the nature and design of the proposed expedition, and soliciting his father's approval of it, and at the same time asking for aid in the way of funds. King Edward replied, cordially approving of the enterprise. He also promised to send on the prince's brother John, with a body of troops to accompany the expedition. This John was the one who has already been mentioned as born in Ghent, 
and who was called on that account John of Gaunt. He was also Duke of Lancaster, and is often designated by that name. Edward was very much attached to his brother John, and was very much pleased to hear that he was coming to join him. The King of England also, Edward's father, made arrangements for sending to his son a large sum of money. This was of great assistance to him, but still he had not money enough. So he broke up his plate, both gold and silver, and caused it to be coined, in order to assist in filling his treasury. Still, notwithstanding all that he could do, he found it difficult to provide sufficient funds for the purchase of the provisions that he required, and for the pay of the men. It was rather late in the season when the prince first formed the plan of this expedition. He was very anxious to set out as soon as possible, for he had the Pyrenees to cross, in order to pass from France into Spain, and it would be impossible, he knew, to conduct an army over the mountains after the winter should set in. So he hastened his preparations as much as possible. He was kept in a continued fever by his impatience, and by the various delays and disappointments which were constantly occurring. In the meanwhile time moved on, and it began at length to be doubtful whether he should be ready to march before the winter should set in. To add to his perplexity, his wife begged him to postpone his departure till the spring, in order that he might remain at home with her until after their child should be born. She was dejected in spirits, and seemed particularly sad and sorrowful at the thought of her husband's going away to leave her at such a time. She knew, too, the undaunted recklessness with which he was accustomed to expose himself to danger in his campaigns, and if he went away she could not but think that it was uncertain whether he would ever return. Finally, the prince concluded to put off his departure until spring. This determination, however, in some sense increased his perplexities, for now he had a large proportion of his force to maintain and pay through the winter. This made it necessary that he should curtail his plans in some degree, and among other things he resolved to notify the Baron d'Albret not to bring his whole complement of one thousand men. It was a great humiliation to him to do this, after having formally agreed to engage the men, but he felt compelled, by the necessity of the case, to do so, and he accordingly wrote to the baron the following letter, quote, My lord d'Albret, whereas out of our liberal bounty we have retained you with a thousand lances to serve under us in the expedition which, through the grace of God, we intend speedily to undertake and briefly to finish, having duly considered the business and the costs and expenses we are at, we have resolved that several of our vassals should remain at home, in order to guard the territories. For these causes it has been determined in our council that you shall serve in this expedition with two hundred lances only. You will choose the two hundred out from the rest, and the remainder you will leave at home to follow their usual occupations. May God have you under his holy protection. Given at Bordeaux the eighth day of December. Edward. End quote. This letter was sealed with the great seal of the prince, and sent to d'Albret who was in his own country, busily engaged in assembling and equipping his men, and making the other necessary preparations. The baron was exceedingly indignant when he received the letter. In those days every man that was capable of bearing arms liked much better to be taken into the service of some prince or potentate going to war than to remain at home to cultivate the ground in quiet industry. D'Albret knew, therefore, very well that his vassals and retainers would be all greatly disappointed to learn that four-fifths of their whole number were, after all, to remain at home, and then, besides this, his own importance in the campaign would be greatly diminished by reducing the force under his command from one thousand to two hundred men. He was extremely angry when he read the letter. Quote, "'How is this?' he exclaimed. "'My lord, the Prince of Wales, trifles with me when he orders me to disband eight hundred knights and squires, whom by his command I have retained.' and have diverted from other means of obtaining profit and honour." Then he called for a secretary, and said to him in a rage, quote, "'Write what I shall dictate to you.'" Quote. The secretary wrote as follows from his master's dictation, quote, "'My dear lord, I am marvellously surprised at the contents of the letter which you have sent me. I do not know and cannot imagine what answer I can make. Your present orders will do me a great injury, and subject me to much blame for all the men-at-arms whom I have retained by your command have already made their preparations for entering your service, and were only waiting your orders to march. By retaining them for your service I have prevented them from seeking honour and profit elsewhere. Some of the knights had actually made engagements to go beyond sea, to Jerusalem, to Constantinople, or to Russia, in order to advance themselves, and now, having relinquished these advantageous prospects in order to join your enterprise, they will be extremely displeased if they are left behind." I am myself equally displeased, and I cannot conceive what I have done to deserve such treatment, and I beg you to understand, my lord, 
that I cannot be separated from my men, nor will they consent to be separated from each other. I am convinced that if I dismiss any of them, they will all go." The baron added other words of the same tenor, and then signing and sealing the letter, sent it to the prince. The prince was angry in his turn when he received this letter. Quote, "'By my faith,' said he, "'this man d'Albret is altogether too great a man for my country, when he seeks thus to disobey an order from my council. But let him go where he pleases. We will perform this expedition, if it please God, without any of his thousand lances.'" End quote. This case presents a specimen of the perplexities and troubles in which the prince was involved during the winter, while organizing his expedition and preparing to set out in the spring. The want of money was the great difficulty, for there was no lack of men. Don Pedro agreed, it is true, that when he recovered his kingdom he would pay back the advances which Edward had to make, but he was so unprincipled a man that Edward knew very well that he could not trust to his promises unless he gave some security. So Don Pedro agreed to leave his three daughters in Edward's hands as hostages, to secure the payment of the money. The names of the three princesses thus pledged as collateral security for money borrowed were Beatrice, Constance, and Isabel. At length, on the third day of April, the child was born. The princess was in a monastery at the time, called the Monastery of St. Andrew, whither she had retired for privacy and quiet. Immediately after the event, Prince Edward, having made everything ready before, gave orders that the expedition should set forward on the road to Spain. He himself was to follow as soon as the baptism of the child should be performed. The day on which the child was born was Wednesday, and Friday was fixed for the baptism. The baptism took place at noon, at a stone font, in the church of the monastery. The king of Majorca, whom the prince had promised to restore to his kingdom, was one of the godfathers. The child was named Richard. On the Sunday following, the prince bade his wife and the little infant farewell, and set out from Bordeaux with great pomp, at the head of an immense cavalcade, and went on to join the expedition which was already on its way to Spain. The birth of Richard was an event of great importance, for he was not only the son of the Prince of Aquitaine, but he was the grandson of the King of England, and of course every one knew that he might one day be the King of England himself. Still, the probability was not very great that this would happen, at least for a very long period to come, for though his father, Prince Edward, was the oldest son of the King of England, he himself was not the oldest son of his father. He had a brother who was some years older than himself, and of course there were three lives that must be terminated before his turn should come to reign in England his grandfathers, his fathers, and his brothers. It happened that all these three lives were terminated in a comparatively brief period, so that Richard really became King of England before he grew up to be a man. The first important occurrence which took place at the monastery at Bordeaux, where little Richard remained with his mother after his father had gone, was the arrival of his uncle John, that is, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, who was on his way from England at the head of an army to accompany his brother into Spain. John stopped at Bordeaux to see the princess and the infant child. He was very joyfully received by the princess, and by all the ladies in attendance upon her. The princess was very fond of her brother, and she was much pleased that he was going to join her husband in the war in Spain. Besides, he brought her late and full news from England. The duke, however, did not remain long at Bordeaux, but after a brief visit to his sister he put himself again at the head of his troops, and hurried forward to overtake the prince, who was already far on his way toward the Pyrenees and Spain. Little Richard remained in Bordeaux for three or four years. During this time he had his brother for a playmate, but he saw little of his father. It was some time before his father returned from Spain, and when he did return he came home much depressed in spirits, and harassed and vexed with many cares. He had succeeded, it is true, in conquering Don Pedro's enemies, and in placing Don Pedro himself again upon the throne but he had failed in getting back the money that he had expended. Don Pedro could not or would not repay him. What Prince Edward did with the three daughters of the king that had been left with him as hostages, I do not know. At any rate, he could not pay his debts with them, or raise money by means of them to silence his clamorous troops. He attempted to lay fresh taxes upon the people of Aquitaine. This awakened a great deal of discontent. The barons who had had disagreements of any sort with Edward before, took advantage of this discontent to form plots against him, and at last several of them, d'Albret among the rest, whom he had mortally offended by countermanding his orders for the thousand men, combined together and sent to the King of France, complaining of the oppressions which they suffered under Edward's rule, and inviting him to come and help them free themselves. 
the king at once determined that he would do this. This king of France was, however, not King John, whom Edward had made prisoner and sent to London. King John had died, and the crown had descended to his successor, Charles V. King Charles determined first to send two commissioners to summon the Prince of Aquitaine into his presence to give an account of himself. He did this under the pretext that Aquitaine was part of France, and that consequently Prince Edward was in some sense under his jurisdiction. The two commissioners, with their attendants, left Paris, and set out on their journey to Bordeaux. People travelled very slowly in those days, and the commissioners were a long time on the way. At length, however, they reached Bordeaux. They arrived late in the evening, and took up their quarters at an inn. The next day they repaired to the monastery where the prince was residing. They informed the attendants who received them at the monastery that they had been sent by the king of France with a message to the prince. The attendants, who were officers of the prince's court, informed the prince of the arrival of the strangers, and he ordered them to be brought into his presence. The commissioners, on being brought before the prince, bowed very low in token of reverence, and presented their credentials. The prince, after reading the credentials, and examining the seals of the king of France by which they were authenticated, said to the commissioners, quote, It is very well. These papers show that you are duly commissioned ambassadors from the king of France. You are welcome to our court, and you can now proceed to communicate the message with which you have been charged. End quote. Of the two commissioners, one was a lawyer, and the other a knight. The knight bore the singular name of Caponel de Caponal. The lawyer, of course, was the principal speaker at the interview with the prince, and when the prince called for the communication which had been sent from the king of France, he drew forth a paper which he said contained what the king of France had to say, and which, he added, they, the commissioners, had promised faithfully to read in the prince's presence. The prince, wondering greatly what the paper could contain, ordered the lawyer to proceed with the reading of it. The lawyer read as follows, quote, Charles, by the grace of God, King of France, to our nephew the Prince of Wales and Aquitaine, health. Whereas several prelates, barons, knights, universities, fraternities, and colleges of the country and district of Gascony, residing and inhabiting upon the borders of our realm, together with many others from the country and duchy of Aquitaine, have come before us in our court to claim justice for certain grievances and unjust oppressions with you, through weak counsel and foolish advice, have been induced to do them, and at which we are much astonished. Therefore, in order to obviate and remedy such things, we do take cognizance of their cause, insomuch that we, of our royal majesty and sovereignty, order and command you to appear in our city of Paris in person, and that you show and present yourself before us in our chamber of Paris to hear judgment pronounced upon the aforesaid complaints and grievances done by you to our subjects, who claim to be heard and to have the jurisdiction of our court. Let there be no delay in obeying this summons, but set out as speedily as possible after having heard this order read. In witness whereof we have affixed our seal to these presents, given at Paris the twenty-fifth day of January, 1369. Charles R. On hearing this letter read, the prince was filled with astonishment and indignation. He paused a moment, with his eyes fixed upon the commissioners, as if not knowing what to reply. At length, with an expression of bitter irony upon his countenance, he said, quote, We shall willingly appear at the appointed day at Paris, since the King of France sends for us, but it will be with our helmet on our head, and accompanied by sixty thousand men. End quote. The commissioners, seeing how much the prince was displeased, began immediately to entreat him not to be angry with them as the bearers of the message. Quote, oh, no, said the prince, I am not in the least angry with you, but only with those that sent you hither. Your master, the king of France, has been exceedingly ill-advised in thus pretending to claim jurisdiction over our dominion of Aquitaine, and in taking the part of our discontented subjects against us, their rightful sovereign. When he surrendered the provinces to the king of England, my father, as he did by solemn treaty, he relinquished forever all jurisdiction over them, and in the exercise of my government I acknowledge no superior except my father. Tell the King of France that is what I claim and will maintain. It shall cost a hundred thousand lives before it shall be otherwise. End quote. Having spoken these words in a calm and quiet, but very resolute and determined tone, the prince walked off out of the apartment, leaving the commissioners in a great state of astonishment and alarm. They seemed to know not what to do. Some of the courtiers came to them and advised them to withdraw. Quote, it is useless, said they, for you to attempt anything more. You have delivered your message faithfully, and the prince has given his answer. It is the only answer that he will give, you may depend, and you may as well return with it to the king. So the messengers went back to the inn, 
and on the evening of the same day they set out on their return to Paris. In the meantime, Prince Edward continued to feel extremely indignant at the message which he had received. The more he reflected upon it, indeed, the more angry he became. He felt as if he had been insulted in having had such a summons from a foreign potentate served upon him by a lawyer in his own house. The knights and barons around him, sharing his anger, proposed that they should pursue and seize the commissioners, with a view of punishing them for their audacity in bringing such a message. At first the prince was unwilling to consent to this, as the persons of ambassadors and messengers of all sorts sent from one sovereign to another were, in those days as now, considered sacred. At last, however, he said that he thought the men were hardly to be considered as the messengers of the King of France. Quote, they are virtually, said he, the messengers of Dalbret and the other factious and rebellious barons among our own subjects, who complained to the King of France and incited him to interfere in our affairs, and as such I should not be sorry to have them taken and punished. End quote. This was sufficient. The knights who heard it immediately sent off a small troop of horsemen, who overtook the commissioners before they reached the frontier. In order not to compromise the prince, they said nothing about having been sent by him, but arrested the men on a charge of having taken a horse which did not belong to them from the inn. Under pretense of investigating this charge, they took the men to a neighbouring town and shut them up in a castle there. Some of the attendants of the commissioners, who had come with them from France, made their escape, and returning to Paris they reported to the King of France all that had occurred. It now came his turn to be angry, and both parties began to prepare for war. The King of England took sides with his son, and so was drawn at once into the quarrel. Various military expeditions were fitted out on both sides. Provinces were ravaged, and towns and castles were stormed. The Prince of Wales was overwhelmed with the troubles and perplexities which surrounded him. His people were discontented, his finances were low, and the fortune of war often turned against him. His health, too, began to fail him, and he sank into a state of great dejection and despondency. To complete the sum of his misfortunes, his oldest son, Richard's brother, fell sick and died. This was a fortunate event for Richard, for it advanced him to the position of the oldest surviving son, and made him thus his father's heir. It brought him, too, one step nearer to the English throne. Richard was, however, at this time only four years old, and thus was too young to understand these things, and probably, sympathizing with his father and mother, he mourned his brother's death. The parents, at any rate, were exceedingly grieved at the loss of their first-born child, and the despondency of the prince was greatly increased by the event. At last the physicians and counsellors of Edward advised that he should leave his principality for a time and repair to England. They hoped that by the change of scene and air he might recover his spirits, and perhaps regain his health. The prince resolved on following this advice, so he made arrangements for leaving his principality under the government and care of his brother, John of Gaunt and then ordered a vessel to be made ready at Bordeaux to convey himself, the princess, and Richard to England. When everything was ready for his departure, he convened an assembly of all the barons and knights of his dominions in a hall of audience at Bordeaux, and there solemnly committed the charge of the principality to his brother John in the presence of them all. He said in the speech that he made to them on that occasion, that during all the time that he had been their prince, he had always maintained them in peace, prosperity, and power, so far as depended on him, against all their enemies, and that now, in the hope of recovering his health, which was greatly impaired, he intended to return to England. He therefore earnestly besought them to place confidence in, and faithfully serve and obey, his brother, the Duke of Lancaster, as they had hitherto served and obeyed him. The barons all solemnly promised to obey these injunctions, and they took the oath of fealty and homage to the Duke. They then bid the prince farewell, and he soon afterward embarked on board the ship with his wife and son, and set sail for England. The fleet which accompanied the prince on the voyage, as convoy to the prince's ship, contained five hundred men-at-arms, and a large body of archers besides. This force was intended to guard against the danger of being intercepted by the French on the way. The prince and the princess must, of course, have felt some solicitude on this account, but Richard, being yet only four years old, was too young to concern himself with any such fears. So he played about the ship during the voyage, untroubled by the anxieties and cares which weighed upon the spirits of his father and mother. The voyage was a very prosperous one, the weather was pleasant and the wind was fair, and after a few days' sail the fleet arrived safely at Southampton. The king, with his family and suite, disembarked. They remained two days at Southampton to refresh themselves after the voyage, and to allow the prince, who seemed to be growing worse rather than better, a little time to gather strength for the journey to London. 
when the time arrived for setting out he was found too ill to travel by any of the ordinary modes and so they placed him upon a litter and in this way the party set out for windsor castle the party travelled by easy stages and at length arrived at the castle here richard for the first time saw his grandfather edward the third king of england they were all very kindly received by him after remaining a short time at windsor castle the prince with his wife and richard and the knights and barons and other attendants who had come with him from aquitaine proceeded to a place called berkhamstead about twenty miles from london and there took up his abode and thus it was that richard for the first time entered the country which had been the land of his ancestors for so long a time and over which he was himself so soon to reign End of chapter five Chapter six of Richard the Second, Makers of History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Richard the Second, Makers of History by Jacob Abbott. Chapter six. Accession to the Throne, A.D. thirteen seventy six. Young Richard lived in comparative retirement with his mother for about six years after his return to England. His father's sickness continued. Indeed, the prince was so feeble in body and so dejected and desponding in mind that he was well nigh incapable of taking any part in public affairs. His brother, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, remained for some time in Aquitaine, and was engaged in continual wars with France, but at length he too returned to England. He was a man of great energy of character and of great ambition, and he began to revolve the question in his mind whether, in case his brother, the Prince of Wales, should die, the inheritance of the Kingdom of England should fall to him, or to Richard, the son of his brother. Quote, my brother Edward is older than I, he said to himself, and if he should live till after our father the king dies, then I grant that he should succeed to the throne. But if he dies before the king, then it is better that I should succeed to the throne, for his son Richard is but a child, and is wholly unfit to reign. Besides, if the oldest son of a king is dead, it is more reasonable that the next oldest should succeed him, rather than that the crown should go down to the children of the one who has died." End quote. The laws of succession were not absolutely settled in those days, so that in doubtful cases it was not uncommon for the king himself, or the parliament, or the king and parliament together, to select from among different claimants, during the lifetime of the king, the one whom they wished to succeed to the crown. All were agreed, however, in this case, the king, the parliament, and the people of the country, that if Edward should survive his father, he was the rightful heir. He was a universal favourite, and people had been long anticipating a period of great prosperity and glory for the kingdom of england when he should be king in the meantime however his health grew worse and worse and at length in thirteen seventy six he died his death produced a great sensation provision was made for a very magnificent funeral the prince died at westminster which was then a mile or two west from london though now london has become so extended that westminster forms the west end of the town it was determined to bury the prince in the cathedral at Canterbury. Canterbury is in the southeastern part of England, and was then, as now, the residence of the archbishop, and the religious metropolis, so to speak, of the kingdom. When the day of the funeral arrived, an immense cavalcade and procession was formed at Westminster. All the nobles of the court and the members of Parliament joined in the train as mourners, and followed the body through the city. The body was placed on a magnificent hearse, which was drawn by twelve horses. Immense throngs of people crowded the streets and the windows to see the procession go by. After passing through the city, the hearse, attended by the proper escort, took the road to Canterbury, and there the body of the prince was interred. A monument was erected over the tomb, upon which was placed an effigy of the prince, dressed in the armour in which the illustrious wearer had gained so many victories and acquired such lasting renown. This engraving represents the effigy of the Black Prince, as now seen upon his monument on the north side of the cathedral at Canterbury. The King of France, although the Prince had been one of his most implacable enemies all his life, and had been engaged in incessant wars against him, caused funeral solemnities to be celebrated in Paris on the occasion of his death. The ceremonies were performed with great magnificence in the chapel of the royal palace, and all the barons, knights, and nobles of the court attended in grand costume and joined in rendering honour to the memory of their departed foe. It was about midsummer when Richard's father died. Richard's uncle, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, was in London, and he had a large party in his favour, though generally he was very unpopular in England. 
he had not yet openly claimed the right to inherit the crown nor did any one know positively that he intended to do so in order to prevent if possible any dispute on this question and to anticipate any movements which john might otherwise make to secure the crown to himself the parliament petitioned the king to bring the young prince edward before them that they might publicly receive him and recognize him formally as heir to the crown this the king did richard was dressed in royal robes and conveyed in great state to the hall where parliament was convened of course the spectacle of a boy of ten years old brought in this manner before so august an assembly excited universal attention the young prince was received with great honour a solemn oath of allegiance was taken by all present including the members of the parliament the great officers of state and a number of nobles of high rank including the duke of lancaster himself in this oath the claims of richard to succeed his grandfather as king of england were recognized and those taking the oath bound themselves forever to maintain his rights against all who should ever call them in question at christmas of that year the king gave a great entertainment to all the lords and nobles of his court at this entertainment he gave prince richard the highest place next to himself putting his uncle john and all his other uncles below him this was to signify that he was now the second person in the kingdom and that his uncles must always henceforth yield precedence to him the king was now sixty-five years of age his health was very infirm it was made so in great measure by his mode of life which was scandalous he associated with corrupt men and women who led him into great excesses as the spring of the year came on he grew worse but he would not abandon his evil habits he lived at one of his palaces on the thames a short distance above london near richmond his government fell into great disorder but he did nothing to restrain or correct the evils that occurred in a word he was fast relapsing into utter imbecility there was a young woman named alice Perrers, who had for some time been the favourite of the king and had openly lived with him greatly to the displeasure of many of his people she was now with him at his palace the nobles and courtiers who had been in attendance upon the king seeing that he was soon to die began to withdraw from him and leave him to his fate they saw that there was nothing more to be obtained from him and that for their future prospects they must depend on the favour of prince richard or of his uncle john it is true that richard's right to the succession had been acknowledged but then he was yet a child and it was supposed that his uncle john being the next oldest son of the king would probably be appointed regent until he should come of age so the courtiers left the dying monarch to his fate and went to court the favour of those who were soon to succeed to his power some went to the palace of the duke of lancaster others proceeded to kennington where the prince and his mother were residing the poor king found himself forsaken of all the world and left to die neglected and alone it is said that alice Perrers was the last to leave him and that she only remained after the rest for the sake of a valuable ring which he wore upon his finger and which she wished to get away from him as soon as the dying monarch was too far gone to be conscious of the robbery the councillors and nobles though they thus forsook the king were not wholly unmindful of the interests of the kingdom they assembled immediately after his death and determined that during richard's minority the government should be administered by a council and they selected for this council twelve men from among the highest nobles of the land they determined upon this plan rather than upon a regency because they knew that if a regent were appointed it would be necessary that the duke of lancaster should be the man and they were unwilling to put the power into his hands for fear that he would not surrender it when richard should come of age besides it would be in his power in case he had been appointed regent to have caused richard to be put to death in some secret way if he chose to do so and then of course the crown would without dispute pass next to him it was not wholly unreasonable to fear this for such crimes had often been committed by rival against rival in the english royal line a man might be in those days a very brave and gallant knight a model in the eyes of all for the unsullied purity of his chivalric honour and yet be ready to poison or starve an uncle or a brother or a nephew without compunction or remorse if their rights or interests conflicted with his own the honour of chivalry was not moral principle or love of justice and right it was mere punctiliousness in respect to certain conventional forms immediately on the death of the king orders were sent to all the ports in the southern part of england forbidding any ship or boat of any kind from going to sea the object of this was to keep the death of the king a secret from the king of france for fear that he might seize the opportunity for an invasion of england indeed it was known that he was preparing an expedition for this purpose before the king died and it was considered very important that he should not hear of the event until the government should be settled 
lest he should take advantage of it to hasten his invasion. The making of these arrangements, and the funeral ceremonies connected with the interment of the king, occupied some days. There was also a difficulty between the Duke of Lancaster and the citizens of London to be settled, which for a time threatened to be quite embarrassing. The case was this. In all accounts of the Reformation in England, among the earliest of those who first called in question the supremacy of the Pope, the name of Wycliffe is always mentioned. Indeed, he has been called the Morning Star of the English Reformation, as he appeared before it, and by the light which beamed from his writings and his deeds, announced and ushered its approach. He was a collegian of the great University of Oxford, a very learned man, and a great student of ecclesiastical and civil law. During the reign of Edward, Richard's grandfather, who had now just died, there had been some disputes between him and the Pope in relation to their respective rights and powers within the realm of England. This is not the place to explain the particulars of the dispute. It is enough here to say that there were two parties formed in England, some taking sides with the Church, and others with the King. The bishops and the clergy, of course, belonged to the former class, and many of the high nobility to the latter. At length, after various angry discussions, the Pope issued a bull addressed to the Archbishop of Canterbury and to the Bishop of London, two of the highest ecclesiastical dignitaries of the realm, commanding them to cause Wycliffe to be apprehended and brought before them for trial on the charge of heresy. The decrees of popes were in those days, as now, generally called bulls. The reason why they were called by this name was on account of their being authenticated by the Pope's seal, which was impressed upon a sort of button or boss of metal attached to the parchment by a cord or ribbon. The Latin name for this boss was bulla. Such bosses were sometimes made of lead, so as to be easily stamped by the seal. Sometimes they were made of other metals. There was one famous decree of the Pope, in which the boss was of gold. This was called the Golden Bull. On the adjoining page we have an engraving, copied from a very ancient book, representing an archbishop reading a bull to the people in a church. You can see the boss of metal, with the seal stamped upon it, hanging down from the parchment. As soon as the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of London received the bull, commanding them to bring Wycliffe to trial, they caused him to be seized and brought to London. On hearing of his arrest, a number of his friends among the nobles came at once to London too, in order that they might support him by their countenance and encouragement, and restrain the prelates from carrying their hostility against him too far. Among these were the Duke of Lancaster and a certain Lord Percy, a nobleman of very high rank and station. The trial took place in the Church of St. Paul's. Wycliffe was called upon to answer to the charges made against him before a very imposing court of ecclesiastics, all dressed magnificently in their sacerdotal robes. The knights and barons who took Wycliffe's side were present too in their military costume, and a great assembly besides, consisting chiefly of the citizens of London. The common people of London, being greatly under the influence of the priests, were of course against Wycliffe, and they looked with evil eyes upon the Duke of Lancaster and the other nobles who had come there to befriend him. In the course of the trial, which it seems was not conducted in a very regular manner, the prelates and the nobles got into a dispute. The dispute at last became so violent that the Duke of Lancaster had the rudeness to threaten the Bishop of London that if he did not behave better he would drag him out of the church by the hair of his head. This was certainly very rough language to address to a bishop, especially at a time when he was sitting, under authority from the Pope, as a judge in a high spiritual court, and clothed in all the paraphernalia of his sacred office. The Londoners were excessively angry. They went out and called their fellow-citizens to arms. The excitement spread and increased during the night, and the next morning a mob collected in the streets, threatening vengeance against the Duke and Lord Percy, and declaring that they would kill them. The Duke's arms, which were displayed in a public place in the city, they reversed, as was customary in the case of traitors, and then growing more and more excited as they went on, they directed their steps toward the palace of the Savoy, where they expected to find the Duke himself. The Duke was not there but the men would have set fire to the palace had it not been for the interposition of the Bishop of London. He, hearing what was going on, repaired to the spot, and with great difficulty succeeded in restraining the mob and saving the palace. They, however, proceeded forthwith to the house of Lord Percy, where they burst through the doors, and ransacking all the rooms, tore and broke everything to pieces, and threw the fragments out at the windows. They found a man dressed as a priest, whom they took to be Lord Percy in disguise, and they killed him on the spot. The murdered man was not Lord Percy, however, but a priest in his own proper dress, 
Lord Percy and the Duke were just preparing to sit down to dinner, quietly together in another place, when a messenger came breathless and informed them what was going on. They immediately fled. They ran to the waterside, got into a boat, and rowed themselves over to Kennington, a place on the southern side of the river, nearly opposite to Westminster, where the young Prince Richard and his mother were then residing. For all this took place just before King Richard's grandfather died. The Lord Mayor and Aldermen of London were greatly alarmed when they heard of this riot, and of the excesses which the citizens of London had committed. They were afraid that the Duke of Lancaster, whose influence and power they knew was already very great, and which would probably become vastly greater on the death of the King, would hold them responsible for it. So they went in a body to Richmond, where the King was lying sick, and made very humble apologies for the indignities which had been offered to the Duke, and they promised to do all in their power to punish the transgressors. The king was, however, too far gone to pay much attention to this embassy. The mayor and aldermen then sent a deputation to Prince Richard at Kennington, to declare their good will to him, and their readiness to accept him as their sovereign upon the death of his grandfather, and to promise faithful allegiance to him on their own part individually, and on the part of the city of London. They hoped by this means to conciliate the good opinion of Richard and of his mother, as well as of the other friends around him, and prepare them to judge leniently of their case when it should come before them. All this, as has already been remarked, took place just before King Edward's death. Immediately after his death Richard and his mother went to Richmond, and took up their residence in the palace where Edward died. On the next day a deputation was sent to the mayor and aldermen of London in Richard's name, calling upon them to appear at Richmond before the king, together with the Duke of Lancaster and his friends, in order that both sides might be heard in respect to the subject matter of the dispute, and that the question might be properly decided. The Duke of Lancaster, they were informed, had agreed to this course, and was ready to appear. They were accordingly summoned to appear also. The Londoners were at first rather afraid to obey this injunction. They did not think that a boy of eleven years of age was really competent to hear and decide such a case. Then they were afraid, too, that the Duke of Lancaster, being his uncle, would have such an influence over him as to lead him to decide just as he, the Duke, should desire, and that thus, if they submitted to such a hearing of the case, they would place themselves wholly in the Duke's power. After some hesitation, however, they finally concluded to go, stipulating only that, whatever disposal might be made of the case, there should in no event any personal harm befall the mayor or the alderman. This condition was agreed to, and the parties appeared on the appointed day before the little king to have the case tried. Richard was, of course, surrounded by his officers and counsellors, and the business was really transacted by them, though it was done in the young king's name. There was no difficulty in settling the dispute amicably, for all parties were disposed to have it settled, and in such cases it is always easy to find a way. In this instance the advisers of Richard managed so well that the duke and his friends were quite reconciled to the Londoners, and they all went out from the presence of the king at last, when the case was concluded, as good friends apparently as they had ever been. The settling of this dispute was the first act of King Richard's reign. Considering how violent the dispute had been, and how powerful the parties to it were, and also considering that Richard was yet nothing but a small, though very pretty boy, we must admit that it was a very good beginning. End of chapter 6Seven of Richard the Second, Makers of History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Richard the Second, Makers of History, by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Seven: The Coronation, A.D. thirteen seventy-seven. The coronation of a monarch is often postponed for a considerable time after his succession to the throne. There is no practical inconvenience in such a postponement, for the crowning, though usually a very august and imposing ceremony is of no particular force or effect in respect to the powers or prerogatives of the king. He enters upon the full enjoyment of all these prerogatives and powers at once on the death of his predecessor, and can exercise them all without restraint, as the public good may require. The coronation is merely a pageant, which, as such, may be postponed for a longer or shorter period, as occasion may require. Richard was crowned, however, a very short time after his father's death. It was thought best, undoubtedly, to take prompt measures for sealing and securing his right to the succession, lest the Duke of Lancaster or some other person might be secretly forming plans to supplant him. King Edward, Richard's grandfather, died on the 22nd of June. The funeral occupied several days, and immediately afterward arrangements began to be made for the coronation. 
the day was appointed for the sixteenth of july on the fifteenth the king was to proceed in state from the palace in the environs of london where he had been residing through the city of london to westminster where the coronation was to take place and as the people of london desired to make a grand parade in honour of the passage of the king through the city the arrangements of the occasion comprised two celebrations on two successive days the procession through london on the fifteenth and the coronation at westminster on the sixteenth on the morning of the fifteenth an imposing train of the nobility led by all the great officers of state assembled at the residence of the king to receive him and to escort him through the city richard was dressed in magnificent robes and mounted upon a handsome charger a nobleman led his horse by the bridle another nobleman of high rank went before him bearing the sword of state the emblem of the regal power other nobles and prelates in great numbers mounted many of them on splendidly caparisoned horses and in full armour joined in the train bands of musicians with trumpets and other martial instruments in great numbers filled the air with joyful sounds and in this manner the procession commenced its march in the meantime the londoners had made great preparations for the reception of the cortege conduits were opened in the various parts of the city to run with wine instead of water in token of the general joy in the heart of the city an edifice in the form of a castle was erected in honour of the occasion this castle had four towers in each of the towers were four beautiful young girls all about richard's age they were dressed in white and their duty was as the king went by to throw out a quantity of little leaves of gold which falling upon and all around the king produced the effect of a shower of golden flakes of snow the procession stopped before the castle there were conduits flowing with wine upon two sides of it the young girls descended from the towers bringing golden cups in their hands these cups they filled with wine at the fountains and offered them to the king and to the nobles who accompanied him on the top of the castle between the four towers there stood a golden angel with a crown in his hand by some ingenious mechanism this angel was made to extend his arm to the king as if in the act of offering him the crown this was a symbol representing the idea often inculcated in those days that the right of the king to reign was a divine right as if the crown were placed upon his head by an angel from heaven after pausing thus a short time at the castle the procession moved on the streets were filled with vast crowds of people who drowned the music of the trumpets and drums by their continual acclamations in this way the royal procession passed on through london and at length arrived at the gate of the palace in westminster here richard was assisted to dismount from his horse and was conducted into the palace between two long lines of knights and soldiers that were stationed at the entrance and upon the staircase to honour his arrival he was glad that the ceremony was over for he was beginning to be very tired of riding on horseback so many hours and of being so long in the midst of scenes of so much noise excitement and confusion the next day was the day appointed for the coronation itself richard was dressed in his royal robes and shortly before noon he was conducted in great state from the palace to the church he was received by a procession of bishops and monks and conducted by them to the grand altar the pavement before the altar was covered with rich tapestry here richard kneeled while prayers were said and the litany was sung by the priests his barons and nobles and the great officers of state kneeled around him after the prayers were over he was conducted to an elevated seat which was richly decorated with carvings and gold a bishop then ascended to a pulpit built against one of the vast gothic columns of the church and preached a sermon the sermon was on the subject of the duty of a king explaining how a king ought to conduct himself in the government of his people and enjoining upon the people too the duty of being faithful and obedient to their king richard paid little attention to this sermon being already tired of the scene he was moreover bewildered by the multitude of people crowded into the church and all gazing intently and continually upon him there were bishops and priests in their sacerdotal robes of crimson and gold and knights and nobles brilliant with nodding plumes and glittering armour of steel when the sermon was finished the oath was administered to richard it was read by the archbishop richard assenting to it when it was read as soon as the oath had thus been administered the archbishop turning in succession to each quarter of the church repeated the oath in a loud voice to the people four times in all and called upon those whom he successively addressed to ask whether they would submit to richard as their king the people on each side as he thus addressed them in turn answered with a loud voice that they would obey him this ceremony being ended the archbishop turned again toward richard pronounced certain additional prayers and then gave him his benediction 
The ceremony of anointing came next. The archbishop advanced to Richard and began to take off the robes in which he was attired. At the same time, four earls held over and around him, as a sort of screen, a coverture, as it was called, of cloth of gold. Richard remained under this coverture while he was anointed. The archbishop took off nearly all his clothes, and then anointed him with the holy oil. He applied the oil to his head, his breast, his shoulders, and the joints of his arms, repeating, as he did so, certain prayers. The choir, in the meantime, chanted a portion of the scriptures relating to the anointing of King Solomon. When the oil had been applied, the archbishop put upon the king a long robe, and directed him to kneel. Richard accordingly kneeled again upon the tapestry which covered the floor, the archbishop and the bishops kneeling around him. While in this position the archbishop offered more prayers, and more hymns were sung, and then he assisted Richard to rise from his kneeling posture, and proceeded to dress and equip him with the various garments, and arms, and emblems appropriate to the kingly power. In putting on each separate article, the archbishop made a speech in Latin, according to a form provided for such occasions, beginning with, Receive this cloak, receive this stole, receive this sword, and the like. In this manner, and with these ceremonies, Richard was invested with a splendidly embroidered coat and cloak, a stole, a sword, a pair of spurs, a pair of bracelets, and finally, with a garment over all called the pallium. All these things, of course, had been made expressly for the occasion, and were adapted to the size and shape of a boy like Richard. The archbishop was assisted in putting these things on by certain nobles of the court who had been designated for this purpose, and who considered themselves highly honoured by the part that was assigned them in the ceremony. When the dressing had been completed, the archbishop took the crown, and after having invoked a blessing upon it by his prayers and benedictions, all in the Latin tongue, he placed it upon Richard's head, repeating at the same time a Latin form, the meaning of which was that he received the crown from God Almighty, and that to God alone he was responsible for the exercise of his royal power. Then came a certain grand officer of the court with a red globe, an emblem of royalty which has long been used in England. This globe the archbishop blessed, and then the officer put it into Richard's hands. In the same manner the sceptre was brought, and after being blessed by means of the same ceremonies and prayers, was also put into Richard's hands. Richard was now completely invested with the badges and insignia of his office. The archbishop then, raising his hands, pronounced upon him his apostolic benediction, and the ceremony, so far, was ended. The bishops and nobles then came up to congratulate and salute Richard on having thus received his crown, after which they conducted him to his seat again. Richard now began to be very tired and to wish to go home, but there was a great deal more yet to come before he could be set at liberty. There was an anthem to be sung by the choir, and more prayers to be said, after which there came what was called the offertory. This was a ceremony in which a person was led to the altar to lay down upon it whatever offering he chose to make for the service of the church. The king rose from his seat and was led forward to the altar, having of course been previously told what he was to do. He had in his hand a sum of money which had been provided for the occasion. He laid down this money first upon the altar, and then his sword. It was the custom in these coronations for the king thus to offer his sword in token of the subordination of his royal power to the law and will of God, and then the sword was afterward to be redeemed with money by the sword-bearer, the officer whose duty it was, on leaving the church, to bear the sword in procession before the king. Accordingly, after Richard had returned from the altar, the earl whose office it was to bear the sword went to the altar and redeemed it with a sum of money, and carried it back to the place where Richard was sitting. Then came the service of the mass, which occupied a long time, so that Richard became very tired indeed before it was ended. After the mass came the communion, which it was necessary for Richard to partake. The communion was, of course, accompanied with more prayers and more chantings, until the poor boy thought that the ceremonies would never be ended. When at last, however, all was over, and the procession was ready to form again to leave the church, Richard was so worn out and exhausted with the fatigue that he had endured that he could not ride home, so they brought a sort of litter and placed him upon it, and four of the knights bore him home on their shoulders. His uncle, the Duke of Lancaster, and the Earl Percy went before him, and a long train of bishops, nobles, and grand officers of state followed behind. In this way he was brought back to the palace. As soon as the party reached the palace, they carried Richard directly up to a chamber, took off all his grand paraphernalia, and put him to bed. He rested a little while, and then they brought him something to eat. His troubles were, however, not yet over, for there was to be a great banquet that afternoon and evening in the hall of the palace, and it was necessary that he should be there. 
Accordingly, after a short time, he was arrayed again in his royal robes and insignia, and conducted down to the hall. Here he had a ceremony to perform of creating certain persons earls. Of course it was his councillors that decided who the persons were that were to be thus raised to the peerage, and they told him also exactly what he was to do and say in the programme of the ceremony. He sat upon his throne, surrounded by his nobles and officers of state, and did what they told him to do. When this ceremony had been performed, the whole company sat down to the tables which had been prepared for a banquet. They continued their feasting and carousing to a late hour, and then amused themselves with various boisterous games common in those days. In the courtyard of the palace a pillar was set up, with pipes at the sides of it, from which there were flowing continually streams of wine of different kinds, and everybody who pleased was permitted to come and drink. A part of the amusement consisted in the pushings and strugglings of the people to get to the faucets, and the spilling of the wine all over their faces and clothes. The top of the pillar was adorned with a large gilt image of an eagle. The next day there were more processions and more celebrations, but Richard himself was, fortunately for him, excused from taking any part in them. In the meantime the people who managed the government in Richard's name heard the news that the French had learned, in some way, the tidings of King Edward's death, and had landed in the southern part of England, and were burning and destroying all before them so they made all haste to raise an army to go and repel the invaders. It was finally concluded, also, to appoint Richard's two uncles, namely John, Duke of Lancaster, and Edmund, Earl of Cambridge, as his guardians until he should become of age. Some persons thought it was not safe to trust Richard to the Duke of Lancaster at all, but others thought it would be better to conciliate him by treating him with respect than to make him an open enemy by passing over him entirely. Richard was considered at this time a very amiable and good boy, and it was generally believed by the people of England that with a right and proper training he would grow up to be a virtuous and honest man, and they anticipated for him a long and happy reign. And yet, in a little more than ten years after he became of age, he was disgraced and dethroned on account of his vices and crimes. End of chapter 7《Of Richard II, Makers of History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Richard II, Makers of History by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 8. Chivalry, A.D. 1378-1380. Besides his uncle John, Duke of Lancaster, Richard had two other uncles, who each acted an important part in public affairs at the commencement of his reign. They were, one, his uncle Edmund, who was the Earl of Cambridge, and afterward Duke of York. Of course, he is sometimes called, in the histories of those times, by one of these names, and sometimes by the other. 2. His uncle Thomas. Thomas was born in the palace of Woodstock, and so was often called Thomas of Woodstock. He was the Earl of Buckingham, and afterward the Duke of Gloucester. Besides these uncles, Richard had a cousin just about his own age, who afterward, as we shall see, played a very important part indeed in Richard's history. This cousin was named Henry Bolingbroke. He was the son of Richard's uncle John, the Duke of Lancaster. He and Richard were now both about eleven years of age, or rather Richard was eleven, and his cousin Henry was about ten. Of course Richard was altogether too young to exercise any real control in respect to the government of the country. Everything was, consequently, left to the Parliament and the nobles. His uncles endeavoured to assume the general direction of affairs, but there was nevertheless a strong party against them. There were no means of deciding these disputes except by the votes in Parliament, and these votes went one way or the other, as one party or the other, for the time being, gained the ascendancy. Every one watched very closely the conduct of Richard's uncle John. He was the next oldest son of Richard III, after Edward, the Prince of Wales, Richard's father. Of course, if Richard were to die, he would become king, and if he himself were to die before Richard did, and then Richard were to die before he grew up and had children of his own, then his son, Richard's cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, would be entitled to claim the kingdom. Thus, while Richard remained unmarried and without heirs, this Henry Bolingbroke was in the direct line of succession, and of course next to Richard himself he was perhaps the most important personage in the kingdom. There was, it is true, another child, the grandchild of an older uncle of Richard's, named Lionel, but he was very young at this time, and he died not long afterward, leaving Henry Bolingbroke the only heir. It is curious enough that, a year or two after this, the French king died, and was succeeded by his son, a boy of about twelve years of age. This boy was Charles the Sixth. He was crowned in France with ceremonies still more splendid and imposing in some respects, 
than those which had been observed in London on the occasion of Richard's coronation. Thus the hopes and fears of all the millions of people inhabiting France and England respectively, in regard to the succession of the crown and the government of the country, were concentrated in three boys not yet in their teens. Of course Richard and his cousin Henry Bolingbroke were rivals from the beginning. Richard and his friends were jealous and suspicious of Henry and of his father, and were always imagining that they were wishing that Richard might die, in order that they might come into his place. Thus there was no cordial friendship in the family, nor could there be any. Of the other nobles and barons, some took sides in one way and some in the other. The boys themselves, both Richard and Henry, were too young to know much about these things, but the leading barons and courtiers formed themselves into parties, ranging themselves some on one side and some on the other, so as to keep up a continual feeling of jealousy and ill-will. In the meantime the French began to retaliate for the invasions of their country which the English had made by planning invasions of England in return. One expedition landed on the Isle of Wight, and after burning and destroying the villages and small towns, they laid some of the large towns under a heavy contribution, that is, they made them pay a large sum of money under a threat that, if the money was not paid, they would burn down their town too. So the citizens collected the money and paid it, and the French expedition set sail and went away before the government had time to send troops from London to intercept them. The French, too, besides invading England themselves on the south, incited the Scotch to make incursions into the northern provinces, for Scotland was then entirely independent of England. A curious story is related, illustrating the religious ignorance which prevailed among the common people of Scotland in those days. It seems that some remarkable epidemic prevailed in 1379 in the northern part of England, which was extremely fatal. Great numbers of people died. The Scotch sent messengers across the border to ascertain what the cause of the sickness was. The English people told them that they did not know what the cause was. It was a judgment from God, the nature and operation of which was hidden from them. They added, however, this pious sentiment that they submitted themselves patiently to the dispensation, for they knew, quote, that every calamity that could befall men in this world came from the grace of God, to the end that, being punished for their sins, they might be led to repent and reform their wicked lives, end quote. The messengers went home, and reported to the Scottish borderers that the English people said that the plague came from the grace of God, not being able, it would seem, to remember the rest of the message. So the priests arranged a form of prayer, addressed to certain saints, which was to be said by the people every morning. This prayer implored the saints to deliver the people from the grace of God, and the dreadful plagues which were sent by it upon men. The form was this. The head of the family would first say, Blessed be, and the others would respond, The Lord. Then the head of the family would say, quote, God and St. Mango, St. Romain and St. Andro, shield us this day from God's grace, and the foul death that Englishmen die of, end quote. And all the others would say, Amen. Thus they considered the grace of God as an evil which they were to pray to be delivered from. Indeed, the common people at this time, not only in Scotland but throughout England, were in a state of great ignorance and degradation. The barons and knights and soldiers generally looked down with great contempt upon all who were engaged in any industrial pursuits. In the country, the great mass of those who were employed in tilling the ground were serfs or slaves, bought and sold with the land, and at the disposal, in almost all respects, of their haughty masters. The inhabitants of the town, who lived by the manufacturing arts or by commerce, were more independent, but the nobles and knights, and all who considered themselves gentlemen, looked down with something like contempt upon these too, as, in fact, their successors, the present aristocracy of England, do at the present day, regarding them as persons in a very mean condition, and engaged in low and ignoble pursuits. Still, the industrial classes had increased greatly in wealth and numbers, and they began to have and to express some opinion in respect to public affairs. They had considerable influence in the House of Commons, and the government was, in a great measure, dependent upon the House of Commons, and was becoming more and more so every year. It is true, the king, or rather the great lords who managed the government in his name, could make war where they pleased, and appoint whom they pleased to carry it on. Still, they could not assess any tax except by the consent of the commons, and thus, in carrying on any great operations, they were becoming every year more and more dependent on the public sentiment of the country. The country began to be very much dissatisfied with the management of public affairs within two or three years after the commencement of Richard's reign. Large sums of money were raised and put into the hands of Richard's uncles, 
who spent it in organizing great expeditions by land and sea to fight the French. But almost all of these expeditions were unsuccessful. The people thought that they were mismanaged, and that the money was squandered. Some of the nobles expended immense sums upon themselves. In the case of one expedition that put to sea from the southern coast of England, the nobleman who commanded it had twenty-five vessels loaded with his own personal property and baggage, and that of his servants and attendants. This man had fifty-two new suits of apparel, made of cloth of gold, immensely expensive. The fleet was wrecked, and all this property was lost in the sea. A great many of the expeditions that were fitted out in England were for the purpose of carrying on wars in Brittany and Aquitaine, in France, for the benefit exclusively of the nobles and knights who claimed possessions in those countries, the mass of the people in England, at whose expense the operations were carried on, having no interest whatever in the result. The worst of it was that in these wars no real progress was made. Towns were taken and castles were stormed, first by one party and then by the other. The engraving represents the storming of one of these towns, and being copied from an ancient picture, it shows truthfully the kind of armour and the mode of fighting employed in those days. Almost the only way of forcing a passage into a castle or fortified town was by climbing over the walls by means of ladders, and overpowering the garrison upon the top of them by main force, as represented in the engraving. Sometimes, it is true, the besiegers of a castle undermined the walls so as to make them fall in and thus open a breach. At the present day mines dug in this way are blown up by gunpowder. But people were little acquainted with the use of gunpowder then, and so they were obliged to shore up the walls while they were digging them by means of posts and beams, and these, after the miners had withdrawn, were pulled out by ropes, and thus the walls were made to fall down. Great engines were sometimes used, too, to batter down the walls of castles and towns. There was one kind of engine, used by the Duke of Lancaster in one of his campaigns in France, in the early part of Richard's reign, which was called a sow. The sow was made in many parts, at a distance from the place besieged, wherever a suitable supply of beams and timber could be obtained, and then was brought on carts to the spot. When it was framed together and put in operation, it would hurl immense stones, which, striking the walls, made breaches in them, or, going over them, came down into the interior of the place, crushing through the roofs of the houses, and killing sometimes multitudes of men. The sow was made, too, so as to afford shelter and protection to a great number of persons, who could ride upon it while it was drawn or pushed up near the walls, and thus reach a point where they could begin to undermine the walls, or plant their ladders for scaling them. The Duke of Lancaster caused one sow to be made, which would carry, in this way, one hundred men. Gunpowder, however, began to be used about this time, though in a very imperfect and inefficient manner. At one siege, namely that of Saint-Malo, a town on the northwestern coast of France, it is said that the Duke of Lancaster had four hundred cannon. They were all, however, of very little avail in taking the town. The wars waged between the English and the French in these chivalrous times were much more personal in their character than wars are at the present day. In that period of the world every great duke or baron or knight was in some sense an independent personage, having his own separate interests to look out for, and his own individual rights and honour to maintain, to a degree far greater than now. The consequence of this was that the narratives of wars of those times contain accounts of a great many personal incidents and adventures which make the history of them much more entertaining than the histories of modern campaigns. I will give one or two examples of these personal incidents. At one time, while the Duke of Lancaster was besieging Saint-Malo with his four hundred cannon, there was a famous Welsh knight named Evan, known in history as Evan of Wales, who was besieging a castle belonging to the English. The name of the castle was Mortain. It was on the river Garonne, in the country of Aquitaine. The castle was so strong that Evan had no hope of taking it by force, and so he invested it closely on all sides, and sat down quietly waiting for the garrison to be starved into a surrender. The castle was near the river. Evan built three blockhouses on the three sides of it. One of these blockhouses was on the edge of a rock before the castle, on the river side. The second was opposite a postern gate, and was intended particularly to watch the gate, in order to prevent any one from coming out or going in. The third blockhouse was below the castle, between the lower part of it and the water. To guard the fourth side of the castle, Evan had taken possession of a church which stood at some little distance from it, and had converted the church into a fort. Thus the castle was completely invested, being watched and guarded on every side. 
The garrison, however, would not surrender, hoping that they might receive succor before their provisions were entirely exhausted. They remained in this condition for a year and a half, and were at length reduced to great distress and suffering. Still the governor of the castle would not surrender. It may seem strange that Evan, a knight from Wales, should be fighting against the English, since Wales had some years before been annexed to the realm of England. The reason was that Evan's family had been driven out of Wales by the cruelties and oppressions of the English. His father, who had formerly been Prince of Wales, had been beheaded, and Evan, in his infancy, had been saved by his attendants, who fled with him to France. There he had been received into the family of the French king, John, and after he had grown up, he had fought under John many years. The older he grew, the more his heart was filled with resentment against the English, and now he was engaged, heart and hand, in the attempt to drive them out of France. Of course the English considered him a traitor, and they hated him much more than they did any of the French commanders, of whom nothing else was to be expected than that they should be enemies to the English, and fight them always and everywhere. Evan they considered as in some sense one of their own countrymen who had turned against them. There was another circumstance which increased the hatred of the English against Evan, and that was that he had taken one of their knights prisoner, and then refused to ransom him on any terms. The English offered any sum of money that Evan would demand, or they offered to exchange for him a French knight of the same rank. But Evan was inexorable. He would not give up his prisoner on any terms, but sent him to Paris and shut him up in a dungeon, where he pined away, and at length died of misery and despair. In consequence of these things, a plot was formed in England for assassinating Evan. A Welshman, by the name of John Lamb, was appointed to execute it. John Lamb set out from England and crossed the Channel to France. He was a well-educated man, speaking French fluently, and he was well received everywhere by the French, for he told them that he was a countryman of Evan's, and that he was going to Mortain to join him. The French accordingly treated him well, and helped him forward on his journey. When he reached Mortain, he came into the presence of Evan, and falling on his knees before him, he said that he was his countryman, and that he had come all the way from Wales to enter into his service. Evan did not suspect any treachery. He received the man kindly, and made many inquiries of him in respect to the news which he brought from Wales. John gave him very favourable accounts of the country, and spoke particularly of the interest and affection which was everywhere felt for him. Quote, the whole country, said he, are thinking and talking continually about you, and are anxiously desiring your return. They wish to have you for their lord. These and other flatteries quite won the heart of Evan, and he took Lamb into his service, and appointed him to a confidential post about his person. For a time after this there were occasional skirmishes between the garrison of Martin and the besiegers, but as the strength of the garrison gradually failed, these contests became less and less frequent, until at last they ceased entirely. The soldiers of Evan then had nothing to do but to watch and wait until the progress of starvation and misery should compel the garrison to surrender. There was no longer any danger of sorties from the walls, and the besiegers ceased to be at all on their guard, but went and came at their ease about the castle, just as if there were no enemies near. Evan himself used to go out in the morning, when the weather was fine, into the fields in front of the castle before he was dressed, and there have his hair combed and pleated a long time for like most of the knights and gentlemen soldiers of those days, he was very particular about his dress and his personal appearance. On these occasions he often had nobody to attend him but John Lamb. There was a place where there was a fallen tree, which formed a good seat, at a spot which afforded a commanding view of the castle and of the surrounding country. He used often to go and sit upon this tree while his hair was combed, amusing himself the while in watching to see what was going on in the castle, and to observe if there were any signs that the garrison were going to surrender. One morning, after a very warm night, during which Evan had not been able to sleep, he went out to this place very early. He was not dressed, but wore only a jacket and shirt, with a cloak thrown over his shoulders. The soldiers generally were asleep, and there was nobody with Evan but John Lamb. Evan sat down upon the log, and presently sent John Lamb to the blockhouse for his comb. Quote, "'Go and get my comb,' said he, "'and comb my hair. That will refresh me a little.'" So John went for the comb. As he went, however, it seemed to him that the time for the execution of his plan had come. So he brought with him from the blockhouse a Spanish dagger, which he found there in Evan's apartment. As soon as he reached Evan, who had thrown off his cloak, and was thus almost naked and entirely off his guard, he plunged the dagger into him up to the hilt at a single blow. Evan sank down upon the ground a lifeless corpse. John left the dagger in the wound, and walked directly to the gate of the castle. 
the guards at the gate hailed him and demanded what he wanted he said he wished to see the governor of the castle so the guards took him in and conducted him into the presence of the governor Quote, my lord said lamb i have delivered you from one of the greatest enemies you ever had Quote, from whom asked the governor Quote, from evan of wales said lamb the governor was very much astonished at hearing this and demanded of lamb by what means he had delivered them from evan lamb then related to the governor what he had done the first impression produced upon the governor's mind by the statement which lamb made was a feeling of displeasure he looked at the assassin with a scowl of anger upon his face and said sternly quote, wretch you have murdered your master you deserve to have your head cut off for such a deed and were it not that we are in such great straits and that we gain such very great advantage by his death i would have your head cut off on the spot however what is done cannot be undone let it pass the garrison did not derive any immediate advantage after all from the death of evan for the french were so incensed by the deed which john lamb had perpetrated that they sent more troops to the spot and pressed the siege more closely than ever the garrison was however not long afterward relieved by an english fleet which came up the river and drove the french away the knights and barons of those days were not accustomed to consider it any hardship to go to war against each other but rather a pleasure they enjoyed fighting each other just as men at the present day enjoy hunting wild beasts in the forest and that chieftain was regarded as the greatest and most glorious who could procure for his retainers the greatest amount of this sort of pleasure provided always that his abilities as a leader were such that they could have their full share of victory in the contests that ensued it was only the quiet and industrial population at home the merchants of london the manufacturers of the country towns and the tillers of the land who were impoverished and oppressed by the taxes necessary for raising the money which was required that were disposed to complain the knights and soldiers who went forth on these campaigns liked to go they not only liked the excitements and the freedom of the wild life they led in camp and of the marches which they made across the country but they liked the fighting itself their hearts were filled with animosity and hatred against their foes and they were at any time perfectly willing to risk their lives for the opportunity of gratifying these passions they were also greatly influenced by a love for the praise and glory which they acquired by the performance of any great or brilliant feat of arms this led them often to engage in single personal combats such for example as this there was a certain french knight named de langurant he was making an incursion into the english territories in the neighbourhood of bordeaux one day he was scouring the country at the head of about forty troopers armed with lances at the head of this troop he came into the neighbourhood of a village which was in the hands of the english and was defended by an english garrison when he approached the village he halted his men and posted them in ambush in a wood quote, you are to remain here a while said he i am going on alone before the town to see if i cannot find somebody to come out to fight me in single combat End quote. the object of de langurin in this plan was to show his daring and to perform a brave exploit which he might have to boast of and glory over afterward among his brother soldiers the men did as he had commanded them and concealed themselves in the wood de langurant then rode on alone his lance fixed in its rest and his helmet glittering in the sun until he reached the gate of the town then he halted and challenged the sentinel the sentinel demanded what he wanted Quote, where is the captain of this garrison said the trooper i wish you to go and find him and tell him that lord de langurant is at the gates of the town and wishes to have a tilt with him i dare him to come and fight with me since he pretends that he is such a valiant man tell him that if he does not come i will proclaim him everywhere as a coward that did not dare to come out and meet me the name of the captain whom de langurant thus challenged was bernard courant it happened that one of bernard's servants was upon the gate near the sentinel at the time this challenge was given he immediately called out to de langurant saying quote, i have heard what you have said sir knight and i will go immediately and inform my master you may rely upon seeing him in a few minutes if you will wait for he is no coward bernard was greatly incensed when he heard the impertinent and boasting message which de langurant had sent him he started up immediately and called for his arms commanding at the same time that his horse should be saddled he was very soon equipped and ready the gate was opened the drawbridge let down and he sallied forth de langurant was waiting for him on the plain this engraving represents the manner in which knights rode to the encounter of each other in single combat. They are each well protected with a helmet, and shield or buckler, and other armor of iron, and are provided with lances and other weapons. These lances were very long, and were made of the toughest wood that could be obtained. The object of each combatant in such an encounter 
is to strike his antagonist with the point of his weapon, so as either to pierce his armour and kill him, or else to throw him off his horse by the shock and force of the blow. If the knight were unhorsed, he lay generally helpless on the ground, being unable to rise on account of the weight of his armour. Of course, in this situation, he was easily vanquished by his adversary. The knights were both mounted on furious chargers, and after a moment's pause, during which they eyed each other with looks of fierce defiance, they put spurs to their horses, and the horses began to gallop toward each other at the top of their speed. Each of the knights, as he advanced, had one end of his lance supported in its rest, while he pointed the other directly toward his antagonist, with a view of striking him with it as he rode by, watching at the same time the terrible point which was coming toward him, in hopes to avoid it if possible, and if not, to bear up against the blow so firmly as not to be unhorsed. The lances were very long, and were made of very solid wood, but the chief momentum of the blow which they were intended to give came from the end of them being supported in a rest, which was connected with the saddle in such a manner that the whole impetus of the horse, as it were, was communicated to the lance, and this impetus was so great that if a lance struck in such a manner that it could not glance off, and did not overthrow the man, but met with a solid resistance, it was often shivered to atoms by the shock. This happened in the present case. The lances of both combatants were shivered at the first encounter. The riders were, however, uninjured. The horses wheeled, made a short circuit, and rushed toward each other again. At the second encounter, Bernard brought down so heavy a blow with a battle-axe upon the iron armour that covered de Longuerrand's shoulder, that the unfortunate trooper was hurled out of his saddle and thrown to the ground. As soon as Bernard could rein in his horse again and bring him round, he galloped up to the spot where de Longuerrand had fallen, and found him attempting to raise himself up from the ground. At the same time, the horsemen whom de Longuerrand had left in the wood, and who had been watching the combat from their place of ambush, seeing their master unhorsed, began to put themselves in motion to come to his rescue. Bernard, who was a man of prodigious strength, reached down from his horse as he rode over his fallen enemy, and seized hold of his helmet. His horse, in the meantime, going on, and Bernard holding to the helmet with all his force, it was torn off from its fastenings, and de Longuerrand's head was left unprotected and bare. Bernard threw the helmet down upon the ground under his horse's feet. Then, drawing his dagger, he raised it over de Longuerrand's head, and called upon him to surrender. Quote, surrender, said he, surrender this instant, or you are a dead man. End quote. The men in ambush were coming on, and de Longuerrand hoped they would be able to rescue him, so he did not reply. Bernard, knowing that he had not a moment to spare, drove the dagger into de Longuerrand's head, and then galloped away back through the gates into the town, just in time to avoid the troop of horsemen from the ambush, who were bearing down at full speed toward the spot, and were now just at hand. The gates of the town were closed, and the drawbridge was taken up the moment that Bernard had entered, so that he could not be pursued. The horsemen, therefore, had nothing to do but to bear away their wounded commander to the nearest castle which was in their possession. The next day he died. While the barons and knights were thus amusing themselves at the beginning of Richard's reign with fighting for castles and provinces, either for the pleasure of fighting, or for the sake of the renown or the plunder which they acquired, when they were fortunate enough to gain the victory, the great mass of the people of England were taxed and oppressed by their haughty masters, to an extent almost incredible. The higher nobles were absolutely above all law. One of them, who was going to set off on a naval expedition into France, seized, in the English seaport which he was leaving, a number of women, the wives and daughters of the citizens, and took them on board his ship, to be at the disposal there of himself and his fellow grandees. For this intolerable injury, the husbands and fathers had absolutely no remedy. To crown the wickedness of this deed, when, soon after the fleet had left the port, a storm arose, and the women were terrified at the danger they were in, and their fright, added to the distress they felt at being thus torn away from their families and homes, made them completely and uncontrollably wretched, the merciless nobles threw them overboard to stop their cries. Taxes were assessed, too, at this time, upon all the people of the kingdom, that were of an extremely onerous character. These taxes were farmed, as the phrase is. That is, the right to collect them was sold to contractors, called farmers of the revenue, who paid a certain sum outright to the government, and then were entitled to all that they could collect of the tax. Thus there was no supervision over them in their exactions, for the government, being already paid, cared for nothing more. The consequence was that the tax-gatherers, who were employed by the contractors, treated the people in the most oppressive and extortionate manner. If the people made complaints, the government would not listen to them, 
for fear that if they interfered with the tax-gatherers in collecting the taxes, the farmers would not pay so much the next time. Richard himself, of course, knew nothing about all these things, or if he did know of them, he was wholly unable to do anything to prevent them. He was completely in the power of his uncles, and of the other great nobles of the time. The public discontent, however, grew at last so great that there was nothing wanted but a spark to cause it to break out into a flame. There was such a spark furnished at length by an atrocious insult and injury offered to a young girl, the daughter of a tiler, by one of the tax-gatherers. This led to a formidable insurrection, known in history as Watt Tyler's Insurrection. I shall relate the story of this insurrection in the next chapter. End of chapter 8《of Richard II, Makers of History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Richard II, Makers of History by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 9. Watt Tyler's Insurrection, A.D. 1381. The insurrection to which a large portion of the people of England were driven by the cruel tyranny and oppression which they suffered in the early part of King Richard's reign is commonly called Watt Tyler's Insurrection as if the affair with Watt Tyler were the cause and moving spring of it, whereas it was, in fact, only an incident of it. The real name of this unhappy man was John Walter. He was a tiler by trade, that is, his business was to lay tiles for the roofs of houses, according to the custom of roofing prevailing in those days. So he was called John Walter the Tyler, or simply Walter the Tyler, and from this his name was abridged to Watt Tyler. The whole country was in a state of great discontent and excitement on account of the oppressions which the people suffered before Walter appeared upon the stage at all. When at length the outbreak occurred, he came forward as one of the chief leaders of it. There were, however, several other leaders. The names by which the principal of them were known were Jack Straw, William Raw, Jack Shepherd, John Milner, Hob Carter, and John Ball. It is supposed that many of these names were fictitious, and that the men adopted them partly to conceal their real names, and partly because they supposed that they should ingratiate themselves more fully with the lower classes of the people by assuming these familiar and humble appellations. The historians of the times say that these leaders were all very bad men. They may have been so, though the testimony of the historians is not conclusive on this point, for they belonged to and wrote in the interest of the upper classes, their enemies. The poor insurgents themselves, never had the opportunity to tell their own story, either in respect to themselves or their commanders. Still, it is highly probable that they were bad men. It is not generally the amiable, the gentle, and the good that are first to rise and foremost to take the lead in revolts against tyrants and oppressors. It is, on the other hand, far more commonly the violent, the desperate, and the bad that are first goaded on to assume this terrible responsibility. It is indeed one of the darkest features of tyranny that it tends, by the reaction which follows it, to invest this class of men with great power, and to commit the best interests of society and the lives of great numbers of men, for a time at least, entirely to the disposal of the most reckless and desperate characters. The lower classes of the people of England had been held substantially as slaves by the nobles and gentry for many generations. They had long submitted to this, hopeless of any change but they had gradually become enlightened in respect to their natural rights, and now, when the class immediately above them were so grievously oppressed and harassed by the taxes which were assessed upon them, and still more by the vexatious and extortionate mode in which the money was collected, they all began to make common cause, and when the rebellion broke out, they rose in one mass, freemen and bondmen together. There was a certain priest named John Ball, who before the rebellion broke out, had done much to enlighten the people as to their rights, and had attempted to induce them to seek redress at first in a peaceable manner. He used to make speeches to the people in the market-place, representing to them the hardships which they endured by the oppressions of the nobility, and urging them to combine together to petition the king for a redress of their grievances. Quote, the king will listen to us, I am sure, said he, if we go to him together in a body and make our request. But if he will not hear us, then we must redress our grievances ourselves the best way we can." The example of Ball was followed by many other persons, and as always happens in such cases, the excitement among the people and their eagerness to hear brought out a great many spectators, 
whose only object was to see who could awaken the resentment and anger of their audiences in the highest degree, and produce the greatest possible excitement. These orators, having begun with condemning the extravagant wealth, the haughty pretensions, and the cruel oppressions of the nobles, and contrasting them with the extreme misery and want of the common people, whom they held as slaves, proceeded at length to denounce all inequalities in human condition, and to demand that all things should be held in common. Quote, things will never go on well in England, said they, until all these distinctions shall be levelled, and the time shall come when there shall be neither vassal nor lord, and these proud nobles shall be no more masters than ourselves. How ill have they used us, and what right have they to hold us in this miserable bondage? Are we not all descended from the same parents, Adam and Eve? What right have one set of men to make another set their slaves? What right have they to compel us to toil all our lives to earn money that they may live at ease and spend it? They are clothed in velvets and rich stuffs, ornamented with ermine and furs, while we are half naked or clothed only in rags. They have wines and spices and fine bread, while we have nothing but rye and the refuse of the straw. They have manners and handsome seats, while we live in miserable cabins, and have to brave the wind and rain at our labour in the fields, in order that, with the proceeds of our toil, they may support their pomp and luxury. And if we do not perform our services, or if they unjustly think that we do not, we are beaten, and there is no one to whom we can complain or look for justice." There is obviously some truth and some extravagance in these complaints. Men deprived of their rights, as these poor English serfs were, and goaded by the oppressions which they suffered almost to despair, will of course be extravagant in their complaints. None but those totally ignorant of human nature would expect men to be moderate and reasonable when in such a condition, and in such a state of mind. The truth is that there always has been, and there always will necessarily be, a great inequality in the conditions, and a great difference in the employments of men. But this fact awakens no dissatisfaction or discontent, when those who have the lower stations of life to fill are treated as they ought to be treated. If they enjoy personal liberty, and are paid the fair wages which they earn by their labour, and are treated with kindness and consideration by those whose duties are of a higher and more intellectual character, and whose position in life is superior to theirs, they are almost without exception satisfied and happy. It is only when they are urged and driven hard and long by unfeeling oppression that they are ever aroused to rebellion against the order of the social state, and then, as might be expected, they go to extremes and if they get the power into their hands, they sweep everything away, and overwhelm themselves and their superiors in one common destruction. Young persons sometimes imagine that the American doctrine of the equality of man refers to equality of condition, and even grown persons, who ought to think more clearly and be more reasonable, sometimes refer to the distinctions of rich and poor in this country, as falsifying our political theories. But the truth is, that in our political theory of equality, it is not at all equality of condition, but equality of rights that is claimed for man. All men, the doctrine is simply, have an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Even when all are in the full enjoyment of their rights, different men will of course attain to very different degrees of advancement in the objects of their desire. Some will be rich, and some will be poor. Some will be servants, and some masters. Some will be the employers, and some the employed but so long as all are equal in respect to their rights, none will complain, or at least no classes will complain. There will of course be here and there disappointed and discontented individuals, but their discontent will not spread. It is only by the long-continued and oppressive infringement of the natural rights of large masses of men that the way is prepared for revolts and insurrections. It was by this process that the way was prepared for the insurrection which I am now to describe. The whole country for fifty miles about London was in a very sullen and angry mood, ready for an outbreak the moment that any incident should occur to put the excitement in motion. This incident was furnished by an occurrence which took place in the family of Walter the Tyler. It seems that a personal tax had been levied by the government, the amount of which varied with the age of the individual assessed. Children paid so much, young men and young women paid more. The line between these classes was not clearly defined or rather the tax-gatherers had no means of determining the ages of the young people in a family, if they suspected the parents reported them wrong. In such cases they were often very insolent and rude, and a great many quarrels took place, by which the people were often very much incensed. The tax-gatherer came one day into Walter's house to collect the tax. 
Walter himself was away, engaged at work tiling a house nearby. The only persons that were at home were his wife and a young daughter, just growing to womanhood. The tax-gatherer said that the girl was full-grown, and that they must pay the higher tax for her. Her mother said, quote, No, she is not full-grown yet. She is only a child. End quote. The tax-gatherer then said he would soon find out whether she was a woman or not, and went to her to take hold of her, offering her rudeness and violence of the worst possible character. The poor girl screamed and struggled to get away from him. Her mother ran to the door and made a great outcry, calling for help. Walter, hearing the cries, seized for a club a heavy implement which he used in tiling, and ran home. As soon as he entered the house, he demanded of the officer, who had now left his daughter and came forward to meet him, what he meant by conducting in so outrageous a manner in his house. The officer replied defiantly, and advanced toward Walter to strike him. Walter parried the stroke, and then, being roused to perfect frenzy by the insult which his daughter had received, and the insolence of the tax-gatherer, he brought his club down upon the tax-gatherer's head with such a blow as to break his skull and kill him on the spot. The blow was so violent that the man's brains were scattered all about the floor. The news of this occurrence spread like wildfire through the town. The people all took Walter's part, and they began to assemble. It seems that a great many of them had had their daughters maltreated in the same way by the tax-gatherers, but had not dared to resist or to complain. They now, however, flocked around the house of Walter, and promised to stand by him to the end. The plan was proposed that they should march to London, and in a body appeal to the king, and call upon him to redress their wrongs. Quote, he is young, said they, and he will have pity upon us, and be just to us. Let us go in a body and petition him. End quote. The news of the movement spread to all the neighboring towns, and very soon afterward a vast concourse collected, and commenced their march toward London. They were joined on the road by large companies that came from the villages and towns on the way, until at length Walter and his fellow leaders found themselves at the head of from sixty to one hundred thousand men. The whole country was, of course, thrown into a state of great alarm. The Duke of Lancaster, who was particularly obnoxious to the people, was absent at this time. He was on the frontiers of Scotland. The king was in his palace, but on hearing tidings of the insurrection, he went to the tower, which is a strong castle built on the banks of the river in the lower part of London. A number of the nobles who had most cause to fear the mob went with him, and shut themselves up there. The Princess of Wales, Richard's mother, happened to be at Canterbury at the time, having gone there on a pilgrimage. She immediately set out on her return to London, but she was intercepted on the way by Tyler and his crowd of followers. The crowd gathered around the carriage, and frightened the princess very much indeed, but they did her no harm. After detaining her for some time, they let her pass on. She immediately made the best of her way to the tower, where she joined her son. As fast as companies of men came from the villages and towns along the road to join the insurgents, the leaders administered to them an oath. The oath bound them, one, always to be faithful and true to King Richard, two, never to submit to the reign of any king named John. This was aimed at the Duke of Lancaster, whose name was John, and whom they all specially hated, three, always to follow and defend their leaders whenever called upon to do so, and always to be ready to march themselves, and to bring their neighbours with them at a moment's warning. four, to demand the abrogation of all the obnoxious taxes, and never to submit again to the collection of them. In this manner the throngs moved on along the roads leading to London. They became gradually more and more excited and violent as they proceeded. Soon they began to attack the houses of knights and nobles and officers of the government which they passed on the way, and many persons, whom they supposed to be their enemies, they killed. At Canterbury they pillaged the palace of the archbishop. The Archbishop of Canterbury, then as now, drew an immense revenue from the state, and lived in great splendour, and they justly conceived that the luxury and ostentation in which he indulged was in some degree the cause of the oppressive taxation that they endured. They assaulted a castle on the way, and made prisoner of a certain knight named Sir John Newton, whom they found in it, and compelled him to go with them to London. The knight was very unwilling to go with them, and at first seemed determined not to do so but they disposed of his objections in a very summary manner. Quote, Sir John, said they, unless you go with us at once, and in everything do exactly as we order you, you are a dead man. End quote. So Sir John was compelled to go. They took two of his children with them also, to hold as security, they said, for their father's good behaviour. There were other parties of the insurgents who made prisoners in this way of men of rank and family. 
and compelled them to ride at the head of their respective columns as if they were leaders in the insurrection in this manner the throngs moved on until at length approaching the thames they arrived at blackheath and greenwich two villages below london farther down than the tower and near the bank of the river here they halted and determined to send an embassage to the king to demand an audience the ambassador that they were to send was the knight sir john newton sir john did not dare to do otherwise than as the insurgents directed he went to the river and taking a boat he crossed over to the tower the guards received him at the gate and he was conducted into the presence of the king he found the king in an apartment with the princess his mother and with a number of the nobles and officers of his court they were all in a state of great suspense and anxiety awaiting tidings they knew that the whole country was in commotion but in respect to what they were themselves to do in the emergency they seemed to have had no idea sir john was himself one of the officers of the government and so he was well known to all the courtiers he fell on his knees as soon as he entered the king's presence and begged his majesty not to be displeased with him for the message that he was about to deliver Quote, i assure your majesty said he that i come not voluntarily but on compulsion the king said to him that he had nothing to fear and directed him to proceed at once and deliver his message the knight then said that the people who had assembled wished to see the king and he urgently requested that his majesty would come and meet them at blackheath Quote, they wish you to come by yourself alone said he and your majesty need have no fear for your person for they will not do you the least harm they have always respected you and they will continue to respect and honour you as their king they only wish to tell you some things which they say it is very necessary that your majesty should hear they have not informed me what it is that they wish to say since they desire to communicate it themselves directly to your majesty the knight concluded by imploring the king to grant his subjects a favourable answer if he could or at least to allow him to return to them with such a reply as would convince them that he their messenger had fairly delivered his message. Quote, because, said he, they hold my children as hostages, and unless I return they will surely put them to death. End quote. The king replied that the knight should have an answer very soon, and he immediately called a council of his courtiers to consider what should be done. There was much difference of opinion, but it was finally concluded to send word to the men that the king would come down to the river on the following day to speak with them, and that if the leaders would come to the bank of the river opposite Blackheath, he would meet them there. So Sir John Newton left the tower, and recrossing the river in his boat, went back to the camp of the insurgents, and reported to the leaders the answer of the king. They were very much pleased to hear that the king was coming to meet them. The news was soon communicated to all the host, and it gave universal satisfaction. There were sixty thousand men on the ground, it is said, and of course they were very insufficiently provided with food, and not at all with shelter. They, however, began to make arrangements to spend the night as well as they could where they were, in anticipation of the interview with the king on the following day. On the following morning the king attended mass in solemn state in the chapel of the tower, and then immediately afterward entered his barge, accompanied by a grand train of officers, knights, and barons. The barge, leaving the tower stairs, was rowed down the river to the place appointed for the interview. About ten thousand of the insurgents had come to the spot and when they saw the barge coming in sight with the royal party on board, they burst out into such a terrific uproar, with yells, screams, shouts, outcries, and frantic gesticulations, that they seemed to the king and his party like a company of demons. They had Sir John Newton with them, they had brought him down to the bank of the river, because, as they said, if the king were not to come, they should believe that he had imposed upon them in the message which he had brought, and in that case they were going to cut him to pieces on the spot. The assembly seemed so noisy and furious that the nobles in attendance on the king were afraid to allow him to land. They advised him to remain in the barge at a little distance from the shore and to address the people from the deck. The king resolved to do so. So the barge lay floating on the river, the oarsmen taking a few strokes from time to time to recover the ground lost by the drift of the current. The king stood upon the deck of the barge with his officers around him and asked the men on the shore what they wished for. Quote, I have come at your request, said he, to hear what you have to say. Such an arrangement as this for communicating with a mass of desperate and furious men would not have been safe under circumstances similar to those of the present day. A man standing in this way on the deck of a boat, within speaking distance of the shore, might with a rifle or even with a musket have been killed in a moment by any one of the thousands on the shore. In those days, however, when the only missiles were spears, javelins, and arrows, 
a man might stand at his ease within speaking distance of his enemies, entirely out of reach of their weapons. When the crowd upon the shore saw that the king was waving his hand to them in order to silence them, and that he was trying to speak, they became in some measure calm. And when he asked again what they wished for, the leaders replied by saying that they wished him to come on shore. They desired him to land, they said, so that he could better hear what they had to say. One of the officers about the king replied that that could not be. Quote, the king cannot land among you, he said. You are not properly dressed, nor in a fit condition in any respect to come into his majesty's presence. End quote. Hereupon the noise and clamour was renewed, and became more violent than ever, the men insisting that the king should land, and filling the air with screams, yells, and vociferations of all sorts, which made the scene truly terrific. The councillors of the king insisted that it was not safe for the king to remain any longer on the river, so the oarsmen were ordered to pull their oars, and the barge immediately began to recede from the shore, and to move back up the river. It happened that the tide was now coming in, and this assisted them very much in their progress, and the barge was swept back rapidly toward the tower. The insurgents were now in a great rage. Those who had come down to the bank of the river to meet the king went back in a throng to the place where the great body of the rebels were encamped on the plain. The news that the king had refused to come and hear their complaints was soon spread among the whole multitude, and the cry was raised, To London! To London! So the whole mighty mass began to put itself in motion, and in a few hours all the roads that led toward the metropolis were thronged with vast crowds of ragged and wretched-looking men, barefooted, bareheaded, some bearing rudely made flags and banners, some armed with clubs and poles, and such other substitutes for weapons as they had been able to seize for the occasion, and all in a state of wild and frenzied excitement. The people of London were greatly alarmed when they heard that they were coming. There was then but one bridge leading into London from the southern side of the river. This bridge was on the site of the present London Bridge, about half a mile above the tower. There was a gate at the end of the bridge next the town, and a drawbridge outside of it. The Londoners shut the gate and took up the drawbridge, to prevent the insurgents from coming in. When the rioters reached the bridge, and found that they were shut out, they of course became more violent than before, and they began to burn and destroy the houses outside. Now it happened that many of these houses were handsome villas which belonged to the rich citizens of the town. These citizens became alarmed for their property, and they began to say that it would be better after all to open the gates and let the people come in. Quote, if we let them come in, said they, they will wander about the streets a while, but they will soon get tired and go away. Whereas by opposing and thwarting them we only make them the more violent and mischievous. End quote. Then besides there were a great many of the common people of London that sympathized with the rioters and wished to join them. Quote, they are our friends, said they, they are striving to obtain redress for grievances which we suffer as well as they. Their cause is our cause, so let us open the gates and let them come in. End quote. In the meantime the whole population of the city were becoming more and more alarmed every hour, for the rioters were burning and destroying the suburbs, and they declared that if the Londoners did not open the gates, they would, after ravaging everything without the walls, take the city by storm, and burn and destroy everything in it. So it was finally concluded to open the gates and let the insurgents in. They came in in an immense throng, which continued for many hours to pour over the bridge into the city, like a river of men above, flowing athwart the river of water below. As they entered the city, they divided and spread into all the diverging streets. A portion of them stormed a jail and set all the prisoners free. Others marched through the streets, filling the air with dreadful shouts and outcries, and brandishing their pikes with great fury. The citizens, in hopes to conciliate them, brought out food for them, and some gave them wine. On receiving these provisions, the insurgents built fires in the streets, and encamped around them, to partake of the food and refreshments which the citizens had bestowed. They were rendered more good-natured, perhaps, by this kind treatment received from the citizens, but they soon became excited by the wine which they drank, and grew more wild and noisy than ever. At length a large party of them began to move toward the palace of the Duke of Lancaster. This palace was called the Savoy. It stood on the bank of the river between London and Westminster, and was a grand and imposing mansion. The Duke of Lancaster was an especial object of their hatred. He was absent at this time, as has been said, being engaged in military operations on the frontiers of Scotland. The mob, however, were determined to destroy his palace and everything that belonged to it. 
so they broke into the house, murdering all who made any resistance, and then proceeded to break and destroy everything the palace contained. They built fires in the courtyard and in the street, and piled upon them everything movable that would burn. The plate and other such valuables as would not burn they broke up and threw into the Thames. They strictly forbade that any of the property should be taken away. One man hid a silver cup in his bosom, intending to purloin it, but he was detected in the act, and his comrades threw him, cup and all, as some say, upon the fire. Others say they threw him into the Thames. At any rate, they destroyed him and his booty together. Quote, we are here, said they, in the cause of truth and righteousness, to execute judgment upon a criminal, and not to become thieves and robbers ourselves. End quote. When they had destroyed everything that the palace contained, they set fire to the building, and burned it to the ground. A portion of the walls remained standing afterward for a long time, a desolate and melancholy ruin. The insurgents felt a special animosity against lawyers, whom they considered mercenary instruments in the hands of the nobles for oppressing them. They hung all the lawyers that they could get into their hands, and after burning the Savoy they went to the temple, which was a spacious edifice containing the courts, the chambers of the barristers, and a vast store of ancient legal records. They burned and destroyed the whole. It is said, too, that there was a certain man in London, a rich citizen named Richard Lyon, who had formerly been Walter the Tyler's master, and had beaten him and otherwise treated him in a cruel and oppressive manner. At the time that he received these injuries Walter had no redress, but now the opportunity had come, he thought, for revenge. So he led a gang of the most desperate and reckless of the insurgents to Lyon's house, and seizing their terrified victim they dragged him out without mercy and cut off his head. The head they stuck upon the top of a pike, and paraded it through the street, a warning, as they said, to all cruel and oppressive masters. A great many other heads, principally those of men who had made themselves particularly obnoxious to the insurgents, were paraded through the streets in the same manner. After spending the day in these excesses, keeping all London in a state of dreadful confusion and alarm, the various bands began to move toward night in the direction of the tower, where the king and his court had shut themselves up in great terror not knowing what to do to escape from the dreadful inundation of poverty and misery which had so suddenly poured in upon them. The rioters, when they reached the tower, took possession of a large open square before it, and kindling up great bonfires, they began to make arrangements for bivouacking there for the night. End of chapter 9